All right, so here we have the body and head scan of a coworker of mine, uh, Jason Maloney, at Ironhead, uh, works with me at Ironhead Studio, who was gracious enough to lend us this scan for this little demo that we're going to do today. Uh, now, when building a helmet on the human head, uh, there are more concerns that you'll have as opposed to building a hard surface model uh, prop that's going to be worn elsewhere on the body. Uh, areas like the arms and the stomach, uh, those areas will give a lot more if you're wanting to achieve a thinner look on your models uh, for you know what the person's going to look like when they're wearing it. Uh, those parts of the body will squeeze into things that you really didn't think they could. But the head, the head, you're pretty much stuck with it. Uh, you know, because there, there's very little tissue draped over the, over the skull in general. Uh, you do have flexible areas such as the nose and the ears, which are primary, primarily cartilage. Uh, but the interesting thing is you think, okay, well, I could uh, get a, tie, a helmet pretty tight onto this, onto the, the talent's head here. But very slight pressure placed around this piece of cartilage here on the earlobe uh, becomes painful very, very quickly. So we want to uh, accommodate a minimum level of clearance uh, in there so that we, you know we're not we're not putting any pressure on uh, these parts of the head now when I am building things off of a human body <clears throat> I have a set of little cubes that I have uh, that are all marked in this case I'm going to be incorporating a minimum 1 8 inch clearance uh, into the inside of my model and uh, that is to allow a air gap between the skin and the inside of the helmet to allow for uh, things such as any straps that need to be glued to the inside and, and just in case you know you're going to have a strap going around the chin uh, also for any minimal padding that will be added to the inside of the helmet uh, so first thing I'm going to do I'm going to go here I'm going to select the head going to go over here we're going to extract zero smooth, zero thickness. We just want to just extract this data just straight up. Accept. Okay. We'll move on to here. Turn off the body. Go over here to geometry, modify topology. We're going to close holes. There we go. Now, to establish this clearance before we start modeling directly off the head, I'm going to go down here to deformation. There we are. And I'm going to go here to inflate. Now, I have this 1 8 inch cube butted up directly against his forehead, and you'll see why I have it there in just a moment. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to start inflating, slowly inflating the head it a little bit more there we go now the goal is to get that inflation to ride the top surface of that eighth inch cube and I know it looks funny right now but uh, it will all make sense soon because now when I start modeling off of the head here I know that I will have at my thinnest point an eighth inch gap between the inside of the helmet and his head so now we are done with the eighth inch cube this down here and to begin modeling off this the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go over here to geometry dynamesh I can dynamesh this at a low value because I, I'm not concerned about any of the details here I was just concerned about making that clearance dynamesh great now go up here we'll divide a few times now uh, when I model off of a head <clears throat> I don't just you know take a different object and start like say a sphere or something and start sculpting on that I will sculpt directly off of this scan data uh, the reasoning for that is is like I said we know that we have a minimum eighth inch clearance between uh, the forehead now on our original scan and now this inflated model so it's just it's just basically being able to know a lot have that confidence along the way that you're you're creating a an accurate model uh, towards the tolerances that you need now <clears throat> The character that we're going to be uh, basing our helmet off of today is uh, the character Nova. 
uh, which I don't know if he's actually going to make an appearance in the Guardians of the Galaxy film. He is within that universe, and it does look like they are going to have some Nova Corps people in there based upon images and previews they've shown. But uh, Nova has always been a, a favorite character of mine. So I figured, hey, let, let's show him some love and let, let's sculpt the helmet based on uh, pre-existing artwork that we've seen in the comics. Now, what I'm doing here first up is, uh, now th I'm going to mask out a rough shape to start with on the helmet. Actually, you know what, let's start over here. Now, when I'm masking this out, I'm not uh, really concerned about, about accuracy on here. Uh, I just kind of came up with a, a simple sketch on, on paper of what uh, the helmet was going to look like. And, you know, because people really like to see uh, costumes and helmets that kind of harken back to the comic roots, at least somewhat, I try to keep it based on uh, some of the better designs I've seen for Nova's helmet. Now, the better designs actually have come in, say, the past several years. Uh, so I tried to, you know, base it on what people are familiar with lately. So, there we go. Now, uh, what I'm doing now is I'll actually mask this just past the halfway point on the head. The reason for that is when I extract, after I extract, we're just going to mirror and weld it. Now, what that's going to do is allow me to just work on both sides at the same time even though, well, let's go over here, there we go, uh, even though uh, the head, the human head, is not uh, symmetrical. And that's something we're going to have to watch out for as we model, is even though I'm basing this on just one half of the head, we need to make sure that after you mirror that you're not actually encroaching on, you know, uh, the other side of the head too, that we're, we're actually mirror modeling on. Okay, so... Now I've got that masked in. I'm not going to sit here and, and worry about how exactly how clean it is uh, because, you know, we're going to be doing uh, a lot of dynameshing on this piece. So, yeah, I've got my outline drawn in. Now what I'm doing is I'm just going back in and filling in the masked area. Again, uh, not really worrying <coughs> about how accurate this is going to be compared to my final concept because we're going to be doing a lot of taffy pulling on this after it's extracted all right there we go nice and masked out okay one last look because when we extract we don't want to have any holes in there that when the extraction is something just something else we'd have to fill Get a little bit a little bit meaner look there okay now now when uh when you extract these pieces you want to try and extract as close to the final thickness of the material that you're going to print as possible so in order to find that value, let's let's just start playing. I'm not going to do double. You don't want to have double turned on because that's going to defeat the purpose of having our eighth inch clearance. It's going to extract inward at the same time. So we're only extracting out. Uh, so let's let's see what happens when we extract. Yeah, see that that's way too thick. That's closer to you know between a quarter and a half inch. So let's drag this down. All right, we're a little too thin. Actually, let's go over here and say 0 0.01. Good, very good thickness. Uh, approximately eighth inch thick. Uh, probably uh, just a little bit shy of it. Uh, with uh, another thing is in consideration you want to have with creating these helmets and your material thicknesses is you want to have the material to be only as thick as necessary uh, because when they cast this in a resin or if they're taking the prop directly off the printer and finishing it there uh, that's added weight uh, and again that's something that can become very uncomfortable to have a heavy helmet on the human head uh, after a very short period of time alright let's go up here 
we're now done with that for now. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go to modify topology. And I'm going to say mirror and weld. Now, there we go. Now let's go here. I'm going to go back to my Dynamesh. Say a little bit higher res to work with. Okay. Now, now this is something we can go in now and really start working on. Now remember to turn on uh, your mirroring so you're, you're creating both sides at the exact same time. Now, let's get into several brushes that I use on a regular basis. Okay. Pinch crease. Uh, now forgive me for not knowing uh, the name of the person who created these brushes. Uh, whoever you are, Thanks a million, because these are great brushes to use. You can get them off of ZBrush Central in the forums. Uh, the first one is Pinch Crease. Uh, the one after that is going to be a brush called Mask Bias that we'll go over. And uh, where's the other one? Mech Cut. Mech Cut Brush. Where are you, Mech Cut? There you are, Mech Cut Brush. Uh, Mech Cut Brush is excellent for creating scribe lines in your model which we will also be going over a little bit later okay so first thing is I want to close this gap so to close this gap I'm just going to taffy pull this back get the, get the seam line close together Not really worrying about how it's looking right now. Go grab my inflate brush. Okay, that looks pretty filled. Let's dynamesh this again. Great. Okay. Let's smooth this down. Now, from here, uh, important settings to have in your brushes. Uh, this I do this pretty much every brush that I use. So I'll go over here to my brush settings. I'll go down to uh, where are we? Auto masking, and always turn on back face masking. Always turn on back face masking uh, when you're doing uh, working on thin models like this because what's going to happen is, as we all know. If you start sculpting here and it starts pulling the surface on the inside, you're going to end up with a surface to where uh, they will actually, oftentimes, the inside surface will touch the top surface and you'll end up with zero thickness. Now, another brush, uh, a, a standard brush in ZBrush that I use is the Trim Dynamic Brush. Now, I like this brush a lot better than H Polish because uh, it takes into account uh, your uh, surface both before and after. Um, the area you're working on so you can really start getting your areas blended into one another really well alright so I'm just gonna knock this back down turn that value down a little bit go here start knocking this ah one thing as you can see obviously that I did forget to do, not practicing what I preach. Okay, back over here, brush, back face masking. All right, mesh that down, bring this out. Now at this point, this is just straight sculpting. Knocking these areas down. Okay. Now, see, you start getting the surface starts evening out. It really starts getting polished. I go in here.
Okay, now start working on the concept for this guy. Start going in, start moving this. Pull this down. Now, first brush, pinch crease brush. Pinch crease is great. Uh, it's it works similar to uh, the, the Dame standard brush uh, in the fact that it will you know kind of uh, pinch up and pull up this really sharp edge. But actually, I like it a little bit little bit better than that brush. So let's go up here to stroke. We're gonna turn our lazy mouse, turn our value really low, our radius really large because I have shaky hands. And pull it out. One thing to go check on brush. Back face masking is turned on. Let's divide this one more time. And what I'll start doing is I'm just I'm just going in here. And I'm not really concerned. Okay, does this look this look messy? Doesn't really matter. Grab my clay brush. My face masking is turned on. And I'm just gonna go in and just start start throwing down throwing down some Z sculpting here. There we go. Start working out some of this brow area. And you know, I'm just I'm just laying down uh, the primary features of my concept that I had had going in my head here. Okay. Go back in, trim dynamic. Start knocking this down. Polishing it out. So basically this process here continues. I'm not gonna uh, bore you with every last stroke. Uh, so I just go in and continue this process of just laying down these basic features. Refining, pushing, pulling. Until, where are we? There we go. This is what I ended up with create some milestone pieces so we can kind of jump through this process a little bit faster. Uh, this is a created using the exact same methods I just showed you. Uh, now, using the same pinch crease brush that I showed you when I was uh, first starting off this area to make these nice edges, trim dynamic to kind of polish that in. So can I come up with these, these basic features of this helmet that I'm making? So, from here uh, in order to now, you know this this at a small scale, this may may print pretty well. Obviously, we have a lot of warbles in the surface, and polishing by hand uh, at this uh, level can become pretty tedious. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use ZBrush's uh, retopology brush and functions in order to create a model that will actually be hard surface and have perfect crisp edges and no warbles along these planes. Let's go to that. So go up here, turn on the topology brush, and real quick, let's go back here, and I'll show you the basics of the topology brush. Go up here to stroke, turn on lazy mouse, radius. Now, the great thing about this is I'm just going to start tracing. 
over my surface of where I might want my retopology uh, to go. And see, just draw them on. There you go. Now, the great thing is, is because also I have it mirrored when I only have to retopo half of it. And the process just continues on from there. Now, go down here, and you will see a fully retopped piece. And uh, for extraction, after you have uh, done all of your retopology, all you need to do is hit Alt and click your model. That is actually uh, finishing the creation of your retopologized surface. Now, we can see we're a little bit thin there. That's, that's going to create too thin of a model that's going to be pretty brittle and fragile when it comes out, even as a cast piece. Unless you're talking something like SLS, in which case you can have materials like nylon, and in which case that would be very strong. Uh, but uh, for the high details we're wanting to achieve, we're probably going to be going with polyjet. So that's too thin. Now to control and change the thickness of your extracted model, you're going to go up here to your draw size. Alt, click. There we go. You're controlling your thickness of your model based upon your draw size. You can go back and reuse those cubes, place them in there on the edge of this uh, your original model so you can get an idea of how thick your piece is actually going to be. Uh, from here, we'll just uh, split these into, uh, into their separate parts so we can get this retopologized model out and we can start working on it which is here now like I said here we have our retopologized model uh, now at this point uh, if we just went in and just started dividing this you know, we can see that it, there's not going to be any hard edges on here. That's something we don't want to have to sculpt back in. Uh, in that case, we're going to be using uh, and showcase the power of polygroups. Now, polygroups are excellent uh, when you're wanting to control uh, how the surfaces on your model smooth and where you want to keep your hard edges. Now, right, I'm going to scroll down over here. I'm actually going to duplicate this. All right, let's turn that one off. Now, uh, let's start off uh, with just a how you're going to end up after you've extracted your retop to model. I'm going to go over here to polygroups. I'm just going to say group visible. Now, let's turn on our poly. Now we can see this is what your model is going to look like after you've extracted it. It's just one complete polygroup. Now we we know for a fact that, that these this leading edge is going to need to be sharp. Uh, all these edges, you know, where we have plane breaks, are going to need to be sharp. So just to get a nice start, first thing you're going to do is say group by normals. Now by default. Uh, your angle tolerance. You can play with this on your model if your model has a lot of ins and outs, maybe uh, knobs and, and things sticking out of it uh, to actually try to find the best solution for the, the auto uh, polygrouping. But typically uh, on a model, you know, is not, not very complex like this. I'll just sit there and say group by normals default is at 45 degrees. And you see it's done a pretty good job. It, it's kept the outside is one poly group, inside is another. Uh, it did have a little bit of a wrap through here. So in order to uh, start going and refining uh, these poly groups ourselves, what we're going to do is we're going to sit there and we're going to want to take extract this one plane break right here and say, okay, we know we're going to have a hard edge here. The hard edge goes there and terminates and that hard edge returns right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to all right, we're going to start hiding all the polys that we do not need. Now 
And if you want to get rid of one entire poly group like these on the inside, just control alt shift, click it, and that entire poly group will go. All right. Okay, let's zoom in. <clears throat> there we go. Let's get rid of you. Rotate around. Okay. Okay. Now we have these polygroups isolated. Now, I can sit there and say group visible which will keep them both exactly the same or I can sit there and say group by normals now they're two different ones but for now so that you know if I need to go back in and add so let's say a logo right here or some scratch details and I want to have them appear on both sides I can easily just isolate both at the exact same time so I'm just going to say group visible click here now you see that is now its own separate polygroup I will continue to do this over the entire model for any uh, edge hard edge looping that I want to occur on the surface when it smooths so obviously I'll have a plane break here you know one through here so I'll just go through and isolate those specific polygons and I'll just say group them as their own polygroup so that uh, when we want to go in and do hard edges here in a moment everything will already be set up really nicely for that okay let's go back here to this one which was the final result where you can see where I've gone in and done polygroups everywhere that I want there to be a hard edge and I want it to respect a border between uh, planes so and now if I just sit here and I just go and just start dividing we're back to where we were before you know it's there's no hard edges there whatsoever so what you can do is let's turn dynamesh off we don't need that anymore go up here to crease crease is under your geometry menu now what this is going to do is we're going to we can actually go to this little button here crease polygroups and what that's going to do is that's going to uh, in between where polygroups meet that's going to make it uh, put in a hard edge now I, I rarely ever mess with the tolerance because this default seems to work work well for me. Uh, but the one you do want to be concerned with is the crease level. Now, its maximum value is 15. And that its assumption is that when you put a hard crease in, you want it to stay 100% sharp at all costs. Uh, now, this is not as relation to, okay, subdivision level 15. That's how many at how many times you have subdivided will it keep so if I subdivide 15 times which would technically be level 16 if we started at zero uh, it will hold that hard edge into oblivion pretty much uh, but you know much like uh, taking cues from cars nowadays you'll have a hard edge that kinda will disappear off into a smooth area uh, I don't want my edges to be sharp as a razor I want them to be sharp but have a little bit of chamfer on the top so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to crease level 3, which means after I subdivide it three times, it will start to let go of that hard crease. So now that we have crease level 3, we're going to say crease polygroup. Now, I don't know if you saw it there. Let me undo. Let me zoom in. Okay. We're going to go crease polygroup. See those little edges that just popped in? Do it one more time. Focus. Look at right there crease polygroup okay and what that did is that added in essence a set of double edges between the separate polygroups the same as you would if you're working in any other 3d package uh, where you went in except now you're not having to go in and add them manually it does it all on its own uh, because we went in and created these polygroups <laughs> Oh,